Before we dive in, this week's episode is brought to you by my free cheat sheet, 30 Top Tips to Find Time to Write. In this guide, I give you 30 ways that you can find time to write in the small gaps that appear between the various errands and tasks and responsibilities that you have in your day-to-day life. Now, you might be thinking that you don't have any time to spare, but I can guarantee these top tips will give you writing time you didn't think you had. If you thought writing always involved a pen and paper or a keyboard, think again. If you thought you needed at least an hour at a time to write your manuscript, I help you reframe that. You won't be disappointed. Get your free copy of 30 top tips to find time to write by going to emmadesi.com forward slash 30 top tips. Okay, let's dive in to today's episode. Alice McVeigh, a London-based ghostwriter, has had two contemporary novels published by Orion Hachette, an award-winning dystopian thriller published by Unbound, and two Amazon category bestsellers with Worley House Press. Her first novel was optioned for filming by Channel 4. Her Kirkus-starred thriller was runner-up in the Independent Press Awards, and Susan, a Jane Austen prequel, was winner of the Pencraft and Global Book Awards in the historical category and a quarter-finalist in Publishers Weekly's illustrious Book Life Prize. Born in Seoul, Alice spent her childhood in Asia with her American diplomat parents. After a cello degree at Jacobs School of Music, she came to London to study with British cello star Jacqueline Dupré. She got married and she stayed. Alice has toured the world with the BBC Symphony and the Royal Philharmonic, but since Covid, she has become a full-time author. She has one daughter and an addiction to tennis. Um, Alice really does exemplify why it's never too late to reinvent yourself. If something's not working or going the way that you want it to or you thought it would go, that doesn't mean that you get to give up. That means you get to try doing it slightly differently. And that could be from the way that you publish. It could be the stories that you're telling. So Alice, whilst on the surface... It sounds like she's had this uh, dream career, both in terms of her music and in terms of her writing. But she's experienced the highs and lows of both. And she talks to us very candidly about those. And she'll be real inspiration for you if you feel that you are feeling lost right now. You're not sure what your next step is. This conversation with Alice will help you know that you can reinvent yourself safely if you wish to and she'll help you just delve a little deeper into yourself and figure out okay what is the right next step for you because as she says it's different for everybody so um yeah let's let's listen to Alice well Alice thank you very very much for joining me today I'm really looking forward to learning more about your your music career and your writing career. You've had this wonderfully creative life. Um, So I wonder if you would just start off by telling us about your journey to writing. Um, Well, I I had an unusual childhood in that I grew up in Asia. Um, My father was an American diplomat. And uh, because of that, when I grew up (laughs) in the 60s um, and where I grew up, which was in Myanmar, among other places, there was no TV. Now, I had one devoted sister one year younger than me, and all we did was make up stories and write them down. So I had a very strange and rather bookish childhood. But my father, in addition to being a diplomat, was an author and my mother an editor. So there were always books everywhere. So he probably would have written anyway, though my sister is an editor and not an author. Um, So I started very early and I wrote my first terrible novel when I was 13. I still got it just to remind myself to be humble. It is truly, truly awful. If you can imagine, though, you're too young. If you can imagine Enid Blyton. Remember Enid Blyton? Yes, yes. Um, Mallory Towers, a sort of Mallory Towers book with sort of murder mystery added on. That's what I perpetuated at the age of 13. And somebody should have shot me. Anyway. um, No, no, um, that's what. (laughs) My daughters love Mallory Towers. (laughs) Does she? Oh, well, I used to love it too. Anyway, um, yes, I, I mean, she had undoubted gift, no question. Anyway, so basically that was where I started with novels and, and then I got distracted by the cello. So um, I came back, we came back, my family came back to me um, from Asia when I was 12, almost 13. And the one consolation I had was that I'd long wanted to play the cello 
and I couldn't. They didn't have any um, teaching in Singapore or Myanmar, my last my last two places I lived. I was born in Korea. So I got to play the cello, and that did distract me. In fact, my whole life can be seen as a kind of zigzag of distraction between being passionate about the cello, passionate about the writing, passionate about the cello, passionate about the writing. And as I said to you in our meeting before, um, when one's gone badly, the other one's normally picked up the slack. So that's been rather good, really. Um, But no, I was passionate about the cello, and I did, I practiced crazy amounts per day. And um, I went to music college. I went to Jacob's School of Music, studied with um, Starker, and then got my dream uh, post-grad appointment. I got to study with Jacqueline Dupre. Um, and that, again, was not quite as amazing as I'd hoped it was going to be. She was a wonderful teacher, but she was also dying. Um, so my timing was off. And she basically sat us down. There were seven of us, the last pupils, Japanese, two Americans, the rest were Brits. And she said, I can't teach anymore. I can't do it. Um, I'm just not well enough. And so I'm, I've handed you all over to my cello daddy, William Plea. And he was, he wasn't as, as good a player as you pray, no one was. But he was as good or even better possibly as a teacher. And he was just like your grandfather. And he was amazing. And he made us all feel as if we could do anything, mm. as if we could play anything. He was just so gifted and so fantastic. Um, so I was fortunate enough at that point to to have um, to be moved from one great teacher to another. Mm-hmm. And then I met my husband, which was also incredibly lucky. And we had this very unromantic proposal in Croydon Immigration Office. I'd overstayed my visa. And they said, right, we're going to deport you um, unless you get married in the next three months. And so Simon goes, want to get married? And I go, okie dokie. And, and, and that was that. So we're still married all these decades later. Um, so yes, that was, that was, that was. Is he a musician as well? He is a musician, but he would say he's a musicologist. He's a professor of music at London University. Um, Mm -hmm. but he's also a very, very fine violin player and pianist. So yeah, I would call him a musician. Anyways, that's how he met with the music. So then I played cello for a bit and then I got very disenchanted with the cello because I was never quite good enough to be a principal cellist and that was my dream. Right. I knew I, I knew I wasn't going to be Jacqueline Dupre because I'd studied with it. But my dream was to be a principal. And um, I was always in the BBC Symphony, World Philharmonic, but I wasn't principal. I wasn't the head of the cellos. And so I got a bit disappointed and despondent. And I thought, I wonder if that novel, that the last novel I wrote, is good enough to be published. And that was a novel I wrote when I was very deeply unhappy, um, many years before, um, in a terrible love affair situation. Anyway, so I just thought, well, I'll just see if I can make it a bit better and send it off. And this was where the miracle happened, because I sent it off to three agents and I picked them out of a hat off, out of the Writers and Artists Yearbook. And one of the three accepted me. And that just doesn't happen. That was just beyond lucky, even in the 1990s. So basically, I was so fortunate. I got somebody who was a, a top agent and she got me a big five contract within about two months. Wow. And then suddenly I was looking at, am I going to play cello anymore or not? Mm-hmm. And I, I sort of, I, I was so smitten with the idea of the novels, which were about the secret life of an orchestra. So I took all the characters that I'd met in all these London orchestras and I mishmashed them together. And uh, also, your, your, your people who listen to this might be interested in this as well. I didn't actually write, uh, my first book was not a novel. It was a series of short stories that interwove together. And that's what the agent liked. And she said, it'd be easier to sell if you wove them closely together and made it into a novel rather than a series of short stories. So I thought, I can do that, because I thought at that point, I can do anything. <laughs> anyway, so so I did that, and that's what she sold. And so it was an interesting way, and I think an, an easy way into writing novels, if you find the whole idea of a, a huge, great 80, 90, 100,000 word thing tricky. Mm-hmm. I think that if you sort of work your way in, by putting a short story about each of the characters that really fascinate you. Well, it worked for me anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was great. And it was number 35 in the bestsellers. And the film rights got sold to Channel 4. Now, it didn't get made, but I can't tell you what an ego boost it was to be you able know, film rights got sold to Channel 4. Oh anyway, um, yes. so basically yes. that was that was, that was was money for nothing. They just gave me £4,000 for doing nothing just to see if they could make an option out of a, series, a TV series out of it. So then the second novel also went well, not quite so well. It didn't reach 35. But then I had a major emotional crisis, which is that all along 
Um, I'd been hoping to have a baby and I couldn't seem to have a baby and nobody knew why. So I um I was basically told that um we shouldn't waste any more money on IBS. That it was just a waste of time. They didn't know I couldn't have a baby, but we could. So at that point, I basically couldn't write at all. Mm. Um, I tried to write, I did my best. I think everybody listening to this will know the feeling of being stuck. But I was stuck in a particularly bad place because I had this contract with a major publisher and a major agent who I was so fortunate to have got in the first place without any background in being published. So I felt mega, mega stressed. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really deliver a third novel at all. It was a kind of mishmash of various ideas that I've had. Um, My publisher, Orion Hatchett, rejected it. My agent dumped me. And I was as low as it's possible to be because I'd also slightly separated myself from my cello contacts. I'd sort of thought, right, I'm going to be a novelist now. So at that point, I was so lucky because the IVF worked. The last IVF worked. And I just didn't believe it. I went to the chemist and I, I took the test and I didn't believe it. So I went I went to the chem- back to the chemist. I got another test. Didn't believe that either. I was too embarrassed to go back to the same chemist because after all, I mean, I just done it twice. I went to another chemist and got a test. And then I, t- I did believe it. And then I did believe it. And so that really changed my life. And I thought, I don't care about it. I mean, I just, just got what I wanted. So I knew I've got to make some money. And I really wasn't in the mood to to tour around the world with my cello when I had baby. So what I did was I decided, and this would be hard for most people to do, but I was lucky because I had made some contacts. Um, I decided to work as a ghostwriter. So what I did was I set myself up rather arrogantly as a ghostwriter with only two novels behind me. And um, I really turned out to be quite good at that because I can sort of enter into somebody's voice and sort of pretend to be them. In the long run, however, it made me really miserable because I felt as if I was not being seen. Mm. I was completely sublimated. First of all, I wasn't Prince or Chava. <laughs> I was one of the ranks of boss. And then next, I wasn't really a writer. I was ghost. I felt as if I was a ghost. Uh-huh. I wasn't there. Yeah. So I did have quite a sort of depression when my daughter was in her late teens um, about that. And so then what happened was she went off to Oxford and I suddenly thought, well, actually I'd had therapy right away. I had several therapies, but you don't want to hear about my therapy. I finally got what I call cured by an energy healer. And basically what she, what happened was two things happened under the energy healing that I had. One was I got the most amazing idea for a science fiction novel. While she while I was meditating and she was healing me to put their hands just over you, um, I suddenly had this vision which I couldn't get rid of. And this was the plot of the one that got published by Unbound, the science fiction book. So that was quite exciting. I did it under my middle name. But um, I didn't know. But the other thing which was exciting was I suddenly felt, after all these years, completely balanced, like I could write for myself again. I had enough nerve to stop pretending and ghosting and being someone else and writing in someone else's world. Mm-hmm. I've rediscovered my own voice through the vision and through the healing. And that's why my current book, my most recent book, which is Jane Austen as um, Harriet, a Jane Austen variation, is dedicated to my energy healer, Heather, because mm-hmm. she's an amazing person and an amazing friend. Wow, well, it's been quite a journey. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been, a, it's been a very weird journey. Um, but, but you know, but, I think, um, Alice, I think that is something I... I is is not unusual particularly amongst women writers that life takes us on a bit of a scenic route until we finally sort of come back to um well for you possibly being an equal passion but for many of the people I speak to it actually is a secret passion that they've had for a long long time and they 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 want to get out of the corporate or corporate's not um giving them what they need anymore and so they make the switch and usually in midlife you know, realize this is what I want to do. So yes. in that respect, um, there's a similar kind of pattern there. However, having said that, not many of the people I speak to throw out their first novel and get picked up by a top agent and a top publisher. Sure luck, sure luck. <laughs> well, don't, luck. don't be, don't be. But don't what, but what I do see there. is, and this, we, we, we said we mentioned this, but I think I am unusual. I haven't been published by a top five publisher, a, a moderate-sized publisher that's unbound in the UK. 
And then deciding in my most recent books to self-publish. And and I actually had I actually had a couple of people interested in these books when I came back to writing. Um, but they were small publishers. They were they were modest, reputable publishers. And um I couldn't get an agent, possibly because of my age. Um, I was in my fifties then. And um and they, they, I think people sort of thought, well, she shot her bull. You know, this is just a ghostwriter hoping for a little last fling. And you see, what agents really want is someone they can invest in, someone they can build, someone that will have a career that will go on. So it is hard as you get older to get them interested. Um, and I did, I did have a couple of nibbles, but I didn't actually land one. So I thought, right, I'll try the, I'll try the independent publishers. I had, I had several interested. I had three interested in the end. Um, one of which I rejected out of hand because they weren't going to give me high enough royalties. Um, the other two offered me decent, um, perfectly okay advances. Again, the royalties weren't great. But what I thought was I go to the Society of Authors, I've been a member there for ages and they're wonderful, and ask them to look over the contracts and tell me what to do. And they won't tell you what to do, but they advise so cleverly you know what they want you to do and afterwards the woman who I spoke to did say that that was that I'd done what she w- would have advised had they been completely and totally you know out there with it so basically they said these people do a fine job on your book and they're prestigious you know they're reputable publishers nothing over that there's nothing funny about the contracts but given your level of drive and enthusiasm given the style of books that you're into at the moment science fiction and a Jane Austen-esque writing. So I, I wasn't doing literary fiction so much as I had earlier. They said, you'd actually do better on your own. Yeah. Because they haven't got the resources, these small publishers, to really publicize your book. Mm-hmm. So you can find those resources or you can crowdfund those resources it's one way or another. You have the dedication. And what they're sort of looking for is, this is a book we'd be proud to publish. Well, we haven't got that much time and energy and money to book into it. And that's an issue I had to face. Mm-hmm. That's really I interesting. Lost, I had a long night of the soul thinking about it. I thought, no, I really, really don't want to mess with all the marketing stuff. I just want to buy it. And, you know, I don't need money. It's no big deal. And my husband said the same thing. He said, don't let it hold you back. But I kept thinking, what about what happened with my with my second book, Ghost Music, um, that Orion published? There was a, a cover that they made for the hardback. It was absolutely divine. It was The Secret Life of an Orchestra, to remind you, and I'm re- reassuring you. And uh, it was a picture of a cellist, um, not a very nice person, as it happened, but a very beautiful girl, and, uh, in front of a Greek uh, a Greek uh, night landscape because the orchestra had toured to Greece during the process of the book. I fell in love with this cover. This cover was a winner, but nobody buys hardbacks. Anyway, so what they did was when the paperback came out, they issued a much less interesting cover. And I said, couldn't we just keep the cover because the paperback's where the sales are? And they just said no. And I thought, you know, if I was my, if I was my, I could do what I wanted. I mm-hmm. could make my own decisions. Um, and the same thing happened to a friend of mine who I won't name, um, with a very, with a, uh, an uh, even more important publisher, uh, probably the most important publisher. She was gifted a title she hated, but they, they did change one of my titles, but I didn't mind. But you know, it, you don't have the control and that bothers some people more than others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It bothered me a lot. Mm-hmm. So how did you find um, working with Unbound? Unbound were fantastic. But what they did was they, um, they're they pretty unusual, Unbound, because what they do is they are a proper publisher and they actually have had people long listed for the Booker Prize. Um, and also my friend Lilo Allison, I've got to just say, was was a long list for the Women's Prize for Fiction by Unbound. So, I mean, you get prize when you books there, but they are kind of in between. So you still have to do most of the marketing. They don't pretend to do most of the marketing. They do the stuff that, that most people are scared of, like the formatting and the designing. They give you a fantastic editor. They give you fantastic proofreaders. They, they set your mind at rest. But it's a, it's a halfway house. I didn't find that as satisfying as I thought I would for the same reasons probably that, that I didn't find. Some people change titles on me when, people, when somebody comes up with an outstanding cover and then I'm not allowed to keep it, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it was tough, mm-hmm. um, but they're perfectly reputable. There's nothing wrong with Unbound. They're, at the moment, they're only doing nonfiction. So I suspect most of your uh, listeners would be more interested in the experience I had with the agent and with the self-publishing. 
Well, Umbain do a lot of memoir, and I know that there's a lot of memoir yeah. writers yeah. in um, in yeah. the audience. So it's uh, I've interviewed a few people who have used Unbound, and it's um, as you say, it's a lot of work. <laughs> They're lovely people. They are lovely people. They really are. They couldn't be nice. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so there is a lot of work that you have to do, but it's very, very worth it. It's a beautiful product at the end that you get it's... some fantastic help. So you've decided to go. Um, uh, Indy, for your Jane Austen-esque stories, what is it that you, you're obviously a big fan of hers. What is it that you love about her stories or the style of writing that you enjoy? I think I'm unusual in that it isn't so much the stories. I mean, I, I adore all of her books. Um, but what, what happened to me was I, I started thinking outside the box a bit and thinking, what would Lady Susan and people are going, who's Lady Susan? She's not in Pride and Prejudice. Um, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice kind of rules the roost as far as um, Jane Austen is concerned. And I'm kind of taking that on because my third one is going to be a Pride and Prejudice variation. But my first one was um, completely made up by me. And it was just this, this villainess that she's got. And the villainess, well, you will know, but not everybody will know. Um, is a 35-something um, manipulator who is not admirable. She not only tries to marry off her lovely daughter, her sweet and lovely daughter, to somebody she hates, but she also tries to disrupt, more or less for fun, somebody's marriage, you know, through adultery. She, this is not a heroine. Anyway, but I thought, because I'm like that, what would this woman have been like when she was just 16? And I couldn't get out of, out of my head that I don't think 16-year-olds can be wicked. I think it's very, very rare and I imagined her instead as rather mischievous and manipulative rather than um, as a problem she turned out. Anyway, so um, that that one was absolutely fine, did fantastically well. Um, and Publishers Weekly said that I wrote like Jane Austen, literally. They said, e um, echoes the master herself. The prose is pitch perfect, echoes the master herself. And that just made, I mean, I was walking on air because for me, what I love so much about it is the style. And unlike a lot of people who like to write like Jane Austen, you know, they put it in modern, well, they put in zombies or something. I'm very traditional. I, I really, I'm more or less hoping in my heart of hearts that someday, once I'm dead, I'll meet Jane Austen. She'll go, you were the one I like. You were the one that uh, explained. <laughs> that, that is my dream. And the second one, though, got quite controversial. And I won't tell you why, because that would spoil it for people. But the second one was a, a version of Emma, which, of course, is one of her masterpieces. And in this particular case, what I do is I actually altered a character. I took the dumb blonde Harriet and I made her into, again, rather manipulative. Really. She was, she was, she was trying to wiggle her way upwards in society without the breeding behind her. Mm -hmm. So she, people have described it as a feminist. I think it probably is fairly feminist. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, and I won't tell you what I'm doing with Darcy, but basically, um, yeah. So I just feel as if having always adored her having most of her books by heart and having a, a, a knack possibly through marrying somebody's quite posh English person of, of, of getting the prose right. Mm -hmm. That it's just something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go with another publisher because they might not commit to it the way I could. Mm, that's that was my thing. And that was what I was advised. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I took the advice so far. So good. <laughs> and, and I really, I've had a, I've had a great time so far and, um, I must say the community has been incredibly supportive. This is a, a plus of writing Jane Austen-esque fiction. People do it, as I say, Jane Austen and zombies. They do it, you know, Jane Austen and let's write murder mysteries. I mean, she's just got this universal appeal. Mm -hmm. And so you get all these, you know, these these sort of clubs and things. And you sort of say, I've written this. Would you be interested? And they're great. They're great. That's lovely. Yay. Yeah. So that's a wonderful um, compliments that you've had then about the, the style of prose. Yes, I was, I was bold on. So with... Did you have to do much research for that? I mean, did you consciously study her style and the way that she writes? Or did uh, She's always been my favourite author. So from the age of about 17, I read all of her books. And I've read most of them every year, more or less, since. So as I said, they're pretty much memorised. I'm, I'm into the rhythm of it. And I think the rhythm is an important word because I'm a musician. I The rhythm of prose matters a lot to me. And I think that's really helped with regard mm. to it. Um, but... Uh, well, yes, I, mean, I, I think it's sheer, just sheer passion. I mean, every now and then I go down to Winchester Cathedral. This is really moving. I go down to Winchester Cathedral. And every time I do that, to put flowers on a grave, 
there are already flowers there. <laughs> there are already flowers there. And it's it's just so many people all over the world just relate to this amazing woman, this amazing author. And um, I, just, I just think I find that so moving. Have you found there to be any um, sort of constraints on your writing because you're you're writing within a pre-existing world or actually has that sort of those 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 constraints have they kind of fueled your creativity in some way? I think um, I think they both I think uh, the constraints are part of what makes it interesting. Um, I mean, plot wise and so forth. I mean, Susan was not allowed to take a walk with an unmarried man, because that would not have been allowed in society in that time. Um, and also, I'm not dead keen on people who shove in a load of sex scenes, because there wouldn't have been a load of sex scenes, you know, not until the marriage door was closed. Um, so so that's that, you know, that's not me, though a lot of people do it. There's a lot of erotica about providing greater sex scenes. And some of it's very good erotica if you're into it. Um, uh, <laughs> I got, I've got some erotica in my science fiction book, well, um, Last Star Standard. So that was quite interesting to do. But no, I think the other thing is it, it does, it fuels your imagination because of the constraints, but it also is, you 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 also want to slightly bend them. Well, I do. Um, you also want to slightly bend them. And that does slightly get you in trouble. So the purists go, you may hurry a different character. Oh, Jane Austen will kill you. You know, I'm going, I don't think she will. I think that secretly she's up there chortling away and going, no, that's clever. I could have done that if I wanted to. <laughs> She'd have done it better. Like, <laughs> oh, so that's great. So you didn't find the the fact that there was the pre-existing world there. Um, it just gave a fuel to your story and uh, the motivation for your characters. Um, but you you did pick up on something there that I was going to ask you about, which is the the does your music um kind of influence your writing and does your writing influence your music in any way is there a sort of connection between the two but you mentioned there that the rhythm is important so I wonder if you could speak into that a little bit I think the rhythm of prose is always important and if somebody was asking me for a tip if they haven't really got stuck into the writing I would just say as so many other people have that one of the best tips I ever got was to have it read to you However badly it's read to you, you notice lump, lumpy bits in the prose that you might not notice otherwise. And I just think that's so helpful. Um, yes, in some respects it has. Um, Jane Austen herself was a musician. She played piano every day. Now, nobody pretends she was a professional standard as I am on the cello. Um, but music inf- has huge influence on her life, massive influence on her life. And what I've done in Harriet, is I've actually taken Harriet and Jane Fairfax. Jane Fairfax is the the beautiful musician. Is also penniless, and I've used that music. I brought. I put more into the music because, in that respect, my only respect, I think I may be ahead of Jane Austen in every other respect: plot, characterization, everything, artistry. I just sit at her feet, but I am a professional cellist, and I have played in Carnegie Hall, and I, I think musically, I. And so I injected more of that. So in other words, um, I do feel it has helped me in that regard. Um, also, I just find that the way people play music, and I know this from my other professional side, it shows their whole character. I once had a teacher, Janusz Starker, he's, he's now dead as well as Dupre, um, a cellist you might not have heard of. He's not quite so famous, but almost. And he said to us, he was rather an arrogant guy in his way, but he was always right. Um, he said, all of you, he said, every time you pick up the cello, you do not need to tell me what you're feeling. I can tell. I can tell if you were in love. I can tell if you were disappointed in love. I can tell if you were having your period. He, you know, it is all in the music. It is all in the music. In his Hungarian accent, which I can't do. Um, but he was also when he said, and I've never forgotten this. <laughs> Let me try if I can do the accent a bit better. He used to say, um, every time you practice, you put, you put the money in the bank. Every time you perform, you withdraw it. And you would probably say, some of us have been overdrawn for years. <laughs> I, so I love that. So every time you practice, you put money in the bank. So that that level of discipline that you needed to practice right. each day um, on your cello, have you found that has been useful for when it comes to doing the work of writing? Uh No. No, I wouldn't say that. No, um, both with the cello and with the writing. If I'm not inspired, I, I just won't do it. 
um I'm not a good example really because I mean some days I write all day and all night and I just don't sleep and some days I can't write at all and if I'm not in the mood I won't do it um so it's not like cello playing I used to I used to just feel right after practice. I just practiced. It was almost as if if I didn't practice, I didn't feel as if I was whole. But with writing, unless I'm inspired, I won't do it because I know I'll be disappointed with what comes out. So um, most of my friends will go, right, hours from 7 to 12, that's when I write. And after that, I'll come out in the tennis court. And I so envy that because I'm not organized like that. So. So now that you, because I, um, I think it's since the pandemic hit, then you've gone to on on to be full time writer. So how does your day look now? Your average day when you're when you're first drafting or you're revising? Um, as I say, there's sort of no average day. If I'm if I'm if I'm on song, if I'm writing really well. I won't do anything else. I will just write. Um, if I otherwise, if it's if it's just one of these sort of things where I'm revising. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll do the revising normally in the morning and then I'll go play tennis because I love playing tennis. And then I'll walk the dogs because I love walking dogs. I've got sausage dogs. I've got long haired dachshunds. My husband's under my feet all the time because he's now retired. <laughs> so I got to look after my husband. And then, you know, I'll, I'll try to do marketing. I'll try to do, I'll try to keep up with social media. I'm without it going out of hand, but I'll secretly be waiting for that thing to go. Yes, that's the part of the scene you were looking for. And normally this will happen between two and four in the morning. So what happens is it will suddenly hit me between two and four in the morning. And then I'll jump out of bed and I'll scribble it down and hope I can read it. And then the next morning I'll be on fire again. And I'll be ready. Uh-huh. <laughs> And so when you're having a day that's going well, do you have a, um, do you, you know, is there some people have a word count that they're trying to achieve in a writing session or, or a time that they're trying, making sure they're at their desk for? Do you have anything like that that helps you gauge sort of the level of progress that you're making with each manuscript? I do, I must admit, always see how many words I've done. But I try, I try to fight this. I really do think this is hampering for a writer because I would rather have 700 or 800 good words than three and a half thousand words that most of which I'll chuck out. You know, um, I would rather feel secure of them. And that's why if I'm not, if I'm not on fire, there's always something else you can do to help your writing career. There really is. There's always something you can do. And um, whether it's it's reaching out to somebody, whether it's doing a video for TikTok, I'm a great fan of TikTok. I'm not very good at it yet, but uh, but but that it's just amazing how book talk has taken off. Um, you know, if if you kind of there's always something you can do that you're more in the mood for, and the writing. But yes, there's always revision. You're absolutely right. You know, what I sometimes make myself do is say, right, I'm not I'm not on fire with the writing. But there's something I can revise. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's really good. So do you like to revise as you go along rather than yes, the definite. first draft? Definitely. But 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 um I've I've noticed that the people I advise do better if they just write the whole first draft and then revise. Because sometimes the revisions can be quite disappointing and you can get you can get waylaid. But I'm experienced now that I can I'd rather do as I go along because what I find is that because I'm not a plotter I don't always know where the plot is going and if I revise it something new will hit me that I might have missed if I just powered straight on through but that's just me and and not everybody is a lot of people really really and they're much more organized and they get their books out on time and probably if I'd been more like them I'd have kept touch up because then I would have got dumped but you see I'm a very impulsive person so that's a character flaw. Um, and there's nothing I can do about it. So. Mm. so, yeah, it sounds like you've made the right decision then. Uh, being an indie, you're your own boss and you give you so, some time so, yeah. and you can work uh, to, to that suits you and your body rhythm and everything. So um, what are you working on now? You can, is there anything you can tell us about? It's the third. Um, it's the third of my Jane Austen esque one. It's Pride and Prejudice at last, because the first two I did were Lady Susan and uh, a version of Emma, and uh, everybody sort of says this is the biggie. So maybe that's why it's taking longer because I'm intimidated. Um, but I guess it'll be a trilogy. And the other thing is that I'm working on a sequel to my orchestral novels. You can buy my first novel, uh, Literary Fiction, on my website, alicemcveigh.com. And the second one, 
um, because I've got the I've got the contracts back from Hatchet. They were lovely. Oh, that's great. Yes, so I'm I'm revising them and dragging them and uh, dragging them twenty years into the into the you know into our time. And this is interesting because when I was playing with orchestras in the 1990s, there were only it was sort of 90 percent men and 10 percent women. You had to be brilliant as a woman to get a chance. Um, and now it's half and half, and it's so much better socially, so much more interesting, and then it's much more diverse, which is terrific. So mm-hmm. I've had to make it more diverse, which is fantastic. So in a way, it's got more interesting in the re- in the re- rewriting of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I've got um, that, and then the second one I'm, I'm revising at the moment. So that's something else I do when I'm not feeling too inspired to write for myself. And then I'm going to make that into a trilogy as well. Mm-hmm. And I've got ideas on that, but I haven't decided completely on the form. So it sounds like having a multiple projects on the go yeah. works best for you, allows you to jump from and keeps your mind interested. But it doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. One of my one of my friends is most successful, and she's the one who got shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, also with Unbound. And uh, very organised, very logical. You can't make a rule for anybody because it's so individual, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't mean she's not, she's super creative. Maybe they're creative. And such a stylist as well, Lulu Allison. Um, uh, but 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 basically, yeah. But it depends what works for you. And I have discovered this works best for me. And I've got a maverick mind; it goes all over the place. And sometimes I just go solve this. I'm going to go play the cellos. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good as well. Yeah, it's something I say to my students a lot. Who you know, because they're writing their first novel. And- yeah. Part of writing your first novel is learning your process and learning what works for you. And you're never going to discover that unless you write a novel. So that's a, a big part of it is, is knowing how your body works and your mind works. And also allow yourself to fail. I mean, my first novel, I told you how bad it was. It is just an embarrassment. You want a really good laugh. You want to pick up the novel I wrote at 13, Mallory Towers sort of thing. And, and just it's just howlingly funny. And the one I wrote at 22 is not much better. Frankly, it was it was more interesting, but it was not very good. So, you know, I think very often people think, well, I'm going to sit down and write the great American novel or whatever it is. And, and you're not, you know, you're really not. Not the first go. No, you've got to be patient your with yourself. You've got to be patient with yourself. And sooner or later, if you really, if it's there, it'll come out. It'll come out. And then you'll be amazed and you'll think, wow, that was waiting to come out all that time. Mm-hmm. But I think that, so that fits in very perfectly, I think, with something you said right at the beginning of our conversation, which is about now that you've come through a lot of the blocks and you're in a better place, that you found your voice. And that only comes, I think, when you've written several novels, several, or several manuscripts anyway, and you've practiced and you've, you've uh, mm-hmm. discovered what works for you and you've kind of loosened up and being able to let the way that you write come out rather than how I think it's part it's partly fear I think it's partly fear that stops people and also there's some people it has to be said unlike me who do it right first time I mean there's I, I just don't think there's any rule I admire those people hugely but yes I've got better and better as I've gone along and and more and more confident and um I I think now if I had a setback the way I did when I was in my 30s I would, I would be fine. I would just think, right, that's one of those things. Life happens. My infertility derailed me. That's life. Then it was the end of the world. Mm-hmm. And I just thought nobody will ever, ever take me seriously as a writer again. And that's another thing you must never believe because, you know, you can reinvent yourself. You can try a different genre. I just think there's, there's, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's a process of reinvention and re-inspiration and keeping going. Yeah. Oh, Alice, it's been lovely talking to you, learning about your journey and your books and your process. Um, For listeners who would like to find out more about you and your books, where is the best place for them to go? Well, um, my my Jane Austen S books are only on, on Amazon at the moment. Um, so you'd have to go to Amazon for those. Um, Susan, a Jane Austen prequel, and Harriet, a Jane Austen variation. Um, if you're interested in the um, the sexy sci-fi, that's anywhere. Um, that's gone wide. That's Last Star Standing by Spaulding Taylor, my two middle names, long story there. Do you want to hear about sexism in the industry? And um, and my first book is only available on my website at the moment. It may, I may put it on Amazon. Um, that's called um, While well, the Music Lasts from T.S. Eliot. And that's by me, Alice McVeigh, on www.alicemcveigh.com. Lovely. Well, thank you. I will be sure to, to link to those. Thank you so much for your time today. Really enjoyed it. 
If you're a first time novelist who is struggling to either finish your novel or get those revisions to where you want them to be, then I've got just the thing for you. I have a small group coaching program which runs over 12 months and over the course of that program I will help you fix those plot problems that you've been struggling with. I'll help you get under the surface of your characters so you really get to know them and what's driving them. And crucially for you, I give you that self-belief that you need to get you through the roller coaster that is writing a novel so that you can carry on, get to the end and get your book, your story out into the world so it can change people's lives. If that sounds good to you, if that is something that you'd be interested in doing, I know I can help you get to where you want to be. So book a call with me. Let's have a chat and see if we are a good fit for each other. If you're interested in doing that, then go to emmadesi.com forward slash story builder. I look forward to chatting. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found that helpful and inspirational. Now, don't forget to come on over to Facebook and join my group, Turning Readers Into Writers. It is especially for you if you are a beginner writer who is looking to write their first novel. If you join the group, you will also find a free cheat sheet there called Three Secret Hacks to Write with Consistency. So go to emmadesi.com forward slash turning readers into writers. Hit join. Can't wait to see you in there. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.